Our theme is Judaics and Christians into Babylon. This is what happened in the second century. I think you'll find this interesting. We have this timeline that I put together. And if you want a copy of this, just email us at our website and we'll send one along to you. Basically, this puts in a chart form for you as a timeline much of the information we've been discussing in these particular messages. Let's take a look at this. Now, I know you can't read all of this because it's pretty small, so I'll just try to explain things to you. You see on the top the blue timeline, and it says Israel. Well, this is biblical Israel. We see the Messiah born at 2 BC, began his ministry at 29, was sacrificed for us on 33, and then it shows James, who was the leader of the church. The church actually being the assembly of the remnant of Israel. And there was a period there, as you can see on this other chart, which is the chart of Judea and what was happening there. It was a period of winnowing that went on. This was a time of separation. What had happened is that Messiah had made the new covenant with those that followed him. And any that entered into that new covenant, they were now part of the real Israel. So what about the ones that didn't enter in? Well, even though they were a bigger number, they were actually a schism that branched off from Messianic Israel, from covenant Israel. So we're going to talk about what happened with them momentarily. But after this, what we just want to see in the timeline is that Israel just continued on. So the idea that Israel was cast off and so on, none of that is really true. Israel continued on under the new covenant. We showed you in history how this continued to be true. This continued to be true under Davidic leadership into the fourth century. Well, Basically, what happened with the great Judaic schism is that the majority of the people belonging to various Jewish sects did not put faith in Messiah. So it amounted to them causing a schism or branching off from true Israel. And there was this period in which there was a winnowing effort to help any of them to get back in the right track as possibly could. Many of them did respond, many thousands in fact, and even some including the leaders did respond, but many others didn't. And finally, all the things that Yeshua said would happen, happened. There was vengeance that fell upon the apostates. Before it fell, all of the believing Israelites there in Judea, they left the area just before the destruction came, having been saved from that destruction through prophecy of Yeshua. So that destruction is where we're going to start tonight. That occurred in 70 A.D., Messiah's prophecy regarding this, he said, they'll fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Well, this is the starting point for that to happen. This is when actually Jerusalem was trampled down. It was destroyed at this time. The temple was destroyed. And this was the beginning of the period where 
they, being the apostate Jews, would fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into the nations and be trampled. And we're going to see that this really got started with a vengeance, literally, during this early period. Well, we've talked about what happened in 70, and it was a total end to the whole temple system. It was all destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. Over a million people were killed in the siege of Jerusalem. Many, many more were led captive. Everything that Yeshua said actually happened to those people. But that was not the end of the struggle between the Jews and the Romans. Many people have not heard of the Kittos War. This is such an interesting rebellion of the Jews against the Romans. This happened around 115 to 117. What actually happened, of course, now there were more Jews scattered around in different places than actually were in Judea. So in these various places throughout the Roman Empire, there were uprisings of the Jews. And in these uprisings, they massacred large numbers of Romans and Greeks. Places listed are Cyrene, Libya, Cyprus, Egypt, Mesopotamia, as well as Judea, in different cities, in all these places. We're told the Jews wage war on the inhabitants throughout Libya in the most savage fashion. And to such an extent was the country wasted that its cultivators, having been slain, its land would have remained utterly depopulated had not the emperor Hadrian gathered settlers from other places and sent them thither for the inhabitants had been wiped out. So what we see from this is, according to historians, in these Jewish uprisings in the Kiddos War, it wasn't just the military, the soldiers, that the Jews rose up against and massacred. It was whole populations of people, farmers, you know, just wiping people, right off of the land. This had a large impact throughout the Roman Empire. A Roman historian says the Jews were destroying both the Romans and the Greeks. And this is kind of gross, but I want to read it so that you can understand what was happening. He said they would cook their flesh, make belts for themselves of their entrails, anoint themselves with their blood, and wear their skins. Many they sawed in two from the head downwards. Others they would give to wild beasts and force still others to fight as gladiators. 220,000 perished. So according to this historian, these Jewish rebels were really very fierce and barbaric in their actions, and obviously they were filled with a vicious hatred towards not only the Romans, but the Greeks as well in abusing them in this way. It goes on and says, For this reason no Jew may set foot in that land. Various persons took part in subduing these Jews, one being Lucius, who was sent by Trajan. This whole event that, interestingly, seldom gets mentioned today. I think people are afraid to talk about it because perhaps they're afraid to be accused of anti-Semitism. And... Certainly, I'm not telling you about it for that reason. However, it's part of the historical record. And if you're going to understand what happened in these first few centuries, you've got to understand that these Jewish rebels behaved 
with the Greeks and Romans, much like we think of ISIS today. They were fierce. They were doing things that were simply unacceptable to human conscience. So think about how people in the West, for example, think of people like that, terrorist kind of people, and how that changes the concept that you have of people from certain places because of these kinds of actions. You know, the Jews had always been actually well thought of throughout the Roman Empire earlier on. The temple was a very big draw. There were synagogues in every major city of the Greeks and Romans. There were many converts. All of this was quite harmonious for quite a long time. But in the Kiddos War, it kind of brought things to a clash of civilizations, if you will, a clash between the Greco-Roman civilization and the Hebraic civilization, and not in a good way. So how can we explain this? Well, the first thing we want to say about this is none of the followers of Yeshua, none of the Nazarene believers participated in any of this. They didn't participate in the first Roman war. They didn't participate in this. They didn't participate later. They had withdrawn from this completely. So these people that are doing this, they're totally apostates from true Israel. And these are basically the chaff that's left over after the widowing process. And so what would you expect but really the dregs left over? And that's the kind of people these people were that were behaving like this. Well, let's continue. Later on in the second century, 132 through 136, we have the Bar Kokhba revolt. And I'm not going to go into this too deeply. There's a lot you could look up about this. This is sometimes called the Third Jewish Roman War or the Third Jewish Revolt. This man was set up by the rabbis as the Messiah of Israel who is going to liberate the Jews and liberate Jerusalem. Didn't work out that way. There was a big battle that cost the Romans a lot. General Julius Severus finally brought this revolt to an end and crushed the rebellion. How they felt at this time this had been dragging on now for decades, and the Romans had had it. They just had had enough of the struggle with the Jews. And so their attitude was, we're just done with this. So we're going to totally crush this right out of existence. And that's basically the way they approached this particular war. When the war was over, at the former temple sanctuary, the emperor installed two statues, one of Jupiter and another of himself. He reestablished Jerusalem as a Roman pagan city with a new name, Elio Capitolina. And Jews were not allowed in the city. And in an attempt to erase any memory of Judea or ancient Israel, he changed the name, wiped it off the map literally, replaced the name with Syria, Palestina. And that came into the English language as Palestine. So, that name from the Romans is still used by many today. You can see how complete this really was because the whole idea was to completely change the character of that land to turn it into something fully pagan, fully Roman, in which the Jews 
would not be able to function. So what happened? Well, it says, according to one Roman historian, 580,000 Jews were killed in that war. 50 fortified towns, 985 villages were burned to the ground. Many more Jews died from famine and disease. And the Jews were reduced to a small minority in Judea. And I should add a small hated minority. Not only that, the Torah was prohibited. The Hebrew calendar was prohibited. And Jewish leaders and scholars were killed. I think one of the main things I have highlighted here, after the revolt, the Jewish religious center shifted to the Babylonian Jewish community and its scholars. See, this is very important because before this, before 70, and then finally leading up to this, there was a remnant of the Judean type of Jewish worship. But... The Romans now had so completely put a stop to Jewish worship in Judea that the Jewish religious center now shifted to Babylon. All along, there had been a big community, Jewish community in Babylon. And this had been the case since the Jews were deported to Babylon some 500 years earlier than this. And so they had continued on. But up to this point, they had been dependent on the Jewish community that was in Judea for leadership in the Jewish religion. But now this all changed. We have this quote, Ever since the Bar Kokhba War, the numerical center of gravity of the Jews shifted to Babylonia and soon after the compilation of the Mishnah in Palestine, Babylonia became the religious center too. Reverence was shown to Judea now only insofar that the pious desired to be buried there. So this caused the ascendancy now of Babylon. Now this is very significant because the community of Babylonian Jews were essentially descendants of the Jews that didn't return to Judea, that stayed in Babylon when the remnant had returned to Judea. So they were the ones that felt comfortable in Babylon. And so they were the ones really more likely to assimilate the Babylonian culture. And indeed, they did in many ways. For instance, the block lettering that is used in Hebrew today was not the original Hebrew. They assimilated that lettering from Babylon when they were there in Babylon. The calendar, the Jewish calendar that is used today, well, the names of the months are actually from the Babylonian calendar, and it's the same calendar. And it was in Babylon that they began to mark off the years with the month of Tishri, which is in the fall, instead of the first month, as it says in the scriptures. That was a change they made. And how about having a month called Tammuz? And they still have that month today. Temaz, of course, was a false Babylonian god. But they adopted that month and that month name along with the rest of the calendar system. Well, there was more that came out of Babylonia besides the calendar system when all of this happened. And that is the calculation of the calendar. You see, they weren't allowed to continue to set the calendar as they always had by observance of the moon. So they took up this method of calculating the calendar 
so the days don't fall exactly the same. And that's all part of Judaism today. The Babylonian Talmud is something else that came from Babylon. And the Babylonian Talmud, while it preserves a lot of history that's probably useful, there's also magic in there. And there's a lot of pretty hateful distortions towards Messiah, his family, and those that followed him. So I think you'd have to say that after the Bar Kokhba War, when Babylonia came into ascendancy among the Jews, it really introduced a period where, in a sense, they went back into captivity to Babylon, adopting many of those same practices again that the community in Babylon had been practicing all along. And, of course, all of this has continued on down through the centuries and is part of Judaism today. And not only that, to the extent that Messianic believers follow these same customs, are they not also then under captivity to Babylon? So it's an important issue. Well, not only did this, in a sense, bring the unbelieving Jewish world into captivity to Babylon, but we have this quote. The Bar Kokhba revolt was among the key events to differentiate Christianity as a religion distinct from Judaism. Jews who regarded Jesus as the Messiah did not support Bar Kokhba, yet they were barred from Jerusalem along with rebel Jews. Now, let me just underscore that point. Those Jewish believers known as Nazarenes, they didn't support any of this that had happened. They weren't involved with the rebellion against Rome at all. They were completely innocent. However, they were Jews. So they were tarred with the same brush as every other Jew. And I think it's a lot like what we see happening today with the refugees from Syria. We have terrorist events happening, and we see in some cases it's very possible that terrorists are coming in along with the refugees. And then we have other people, no doubt, in that group who are perfectly innocent. Some of them actually being Christians who are fleeing from persecution. But when they come into our land, how do we know? We don't know the difference between the Christians, the victimized Muslims, and the terrorists who are coming here to kill us. So what is the thought of the population here about these refugees? You see, since we don't really understand them, we don't know their culture, we don't know anything about who they are that are coming in, there's a lot of concern, and it's a broad brush. It's everybody that we're concerned about. And I think you'd have to say rightfully so. Well, that's how it was here in the second century, after the Bar Kokhba War and these other wars. This is where the Roman world was at. They saw a Jew, and they thought, well, are you here to kill me, or are you a good guy? They didn't know. So this was a position that our brethren, who were followers of Messiah, were in. And you can imagine what a difficult position that was for them. They were also hated, by the way, by the unbelieving Jews. So it was a difficult thing. So what it's telling us is it's at this time, after this war, and basically Rome put an end to the revolt once and for all, that this was one of the key events that differentiated Christianity as distinct from Judaism. Now, here's something to think about. 
It's 136 AD, and Christianity up to that time was not yet distinct from Judaism. You see how that goes right along with what we had been teaching about the Gentile Christian church? The Gentile Christian church did not exist even up to this time. It was still the Nazarene movement. They were still considered a sect of the Jews, the sect of the Nazarenes. It was only after this series of wars with the Jews, when all this hatred was built up against the Jews, that Christianity actually broke off from that first Nazarene movement. And what do you call it when there's the true movement and then others break off from it? That is a schism. That is apostasy away from the truth. That's what that is. And this is the very point in history where this happens. So where is the beginning of Christianity? It's not with the apostles. It's here. I'm going to show you more about that. Here, though, is our chart again. And we're going to try and put this together for you. You see on the chart, we have about 135 A.D., the great Gentile apostasy. And this is when Greco-Roman Christendom started to surface. And it's because this great hatred for the Jews actually made it possible, gave them an excuse to break away from the leadership, from the Hebraic leadership that they were under up until that time. Here's the guy that was the first one to actually document this. His name was Justin Martyr. He was born in Neapolis in Judea. This is modern-day Nablus. He was a pagan. And he called himself a Gentile. He's thought to possibly have descended from a Roman diplomatic community that had been sent there. So what does this mean? Well, this means he has very close ties to all these wars that happened, right? His family was on the side of the Romans in these wars. So how is he going to feel about the Jews? Well, there's more about him. He was an educated man, schooled in all the major philosophical schools of that time with the pagan philosophies that were popular in the day. And he went through a period of years studying these things studying these various pagan philosophies. When in Syria, in other words, probably Judea, he happened upon a man who seems to be a Syrian Nazarene. And that man told him about the Messiah. Justin was moved by what he heard from this man about the Messiah so he adopted his own version of the story about the Messiah. I say his own version because I think what he did next kind of tells us that he was still doing his own thing. Instead of becoming a part of the Nazarene community, he adopted the dress of a philosopher. And you know, these Greek philosophers had a certain way that they looked, just like we have in our culture. You can kind of tell different people by the way they dress. So he presented himself as a philosopher, went around teaching a version about the Messiah that wove in a lot of things from 
philosophy, from Greek philosophy. Finally, he went to Rome, established a school there, taught at that school until he was beheaded. A little bit more about this guy. He believed that the seeds of true religion predated Christ, but not among the Hebrews. This allowed him to claim many historical Greek philosophers in whose work he was well studied as unknowing Christians. So just like you and I, we might quote one of the prophets, one of the apostles. He would do that too, but then he could very readily quote these various philosophers and then just weave that right into the presentation. So it was a mixture. This is what he was doing, is he was mixing what was in the scriptures along with what he had learned in these philosophical schools. Well, this is an interesting quote, I think. One scholar discovered blemishes in Justin's theology, which he attributed to the influence of pagan philosophers. Other scholars recognized he was a thorough Hellene. In other words, he was totally Greek through and through. And they say because he was a Gentile, he did not fully understand the Old Testament foundation of Paul's teaching. And therefore, he modified the character of his Paulism. So in other words, because he didn't really understand the Old Testament, when he read Paul's words, he interpreted it differently than what Paul meant because Paul was speaking from a Torah base. Now, this is really a big thing because Justin was the first of the so-called church fathers to express ideas that were anti-Hebraic. He was against the Jews. And, of course, this gave him a license to then adopt a more Greek idea of the Messiah. So in his writings, he will quote from the New Testament. He quotes from Paul and from others. And he will use allegory, and he will interpret it according to his Greek understanding. So why do you think Christians today are so messed up about Paul? The whole tradition started with him. He started writing this stuff, and this really set a certain pattern for the so-called church fathers after him as to how they interpreted Paul, how they interpreted the New Testament. And so really we have a lot of not only misinterpretations, but mistranslations of books of the New Testament because they're being interpreted and translated from a Greek point of view rather than from the original Hebraic point of view that they were written from. Well, this is the effect of this. As Christianity spread throughout the Hellenic world, an increasing number of church leaders were educated in Greek philosophy. The dominant philosophical traditions of the Greco-Roman world at the time were Stoicism, Platonism, and Epicureanism. Stoicism, and particularly Platonism, were readily incorporated into Christian ethics and Christian theology. It's easy to see this as you look at the development of Christianity. You have things that clearly do equate to the New Testament, but then you have other practices of some of these church fathers. For instance, some of them castrated themselves. And they did this it would seem to agree with the scriptures to put away the lust of the flesh and so on. 
But actually, as you dig deeper, you find out that these ideas really originate among some of these Greek philosophers. There are other things like really a hatred of women on the part of some of these people. Looking at what happened with Eve and then blaming all women for what Eve did because, you see, the underlying thing, they had come from some of these philosophical schools that did not look well on women. And they brought their customs with them. Other kinds of things like celibacy and enforced celibacy. The change in the organization of the churches with an authoritarian bishop over an area and this sort of thing. Bringing it into harmony with Greek and Roman thought instead of the way things were actually set up according to Scripture. Well, it gets worse. Secrets of the mystery religions were incorporated. You see, long before this, the mystery religions of Babylon had penetrated throughout the Greek and Roman world. And as a matter of fact, there were a lot of people that had originated under these Babylonian religions that had been taken as slaves by the Romans. And they were very prolific. The Romans were more aristocrats. They didn't want to have a lot of children. They were a lot like Western society today, where a lot of Western society people think, well, one or two children is enough. But these Babylonian slaves they brought in, they had lots of children. And over a period of time, there were actually more people of that Eastern heritage than there were the earlier native Roman population. And so they had all brought these mystery religions of Babylon with them. And of course, they didn't stay slaves. You know, over time, they were assimilated into the population and achieved success, and in some cases were even part of the aristocracy and the leadership. So all of this was part of the amalgamation that came into early Christianity in the second century. Well, this was very contrary to what the Scripture says. Here's from Jude. 1, three. It says, Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all time delivered to the holy ones. What is the faith that is once for all time delivered to the holy ones? Right away, many people say Christianity. But it isn't. It's the primitive Hebrew faith. And it's easy to prove even Paul himself writes about this in Romans chapter 9. He says, Israelites, whose is the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service, the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom is Messiah? This is the faith that's given once for all time. In not holding to that, it then opens up a person to all of this smorgasbord of paganism that's out there. And that's exactly what happened to Justin and those who followed in his footsteps. And the reason it happened is, I think, fairly easy for us to understand when we understand the history. When we see what happened with the Jews and how they had really garnered the hatred of everybody throughout the Roman Empire, you can kind of understand how Justin would then say, oh, it's from the Jews, I don't want it. Kind of that idea. Justin wrote a work called Dialogue with Trifo, which is his principal polemic against Judaism. And it's very interesting because it is presented as a dialogue with a Jew during the Bar Kokhba War, 
who fled from Jerusalem. So it's very close to these historical events we've been talking about, and obviously this was formative to Justin's ideas to actually have a Jew who's a survivor of these wars as the person that he's dialoguing against. In this dialogue, what we find Justin doing is a lot of figurative interpretations of the scriptures. Rather than literal interpretations of what the scriptures say, he imposes this spiritualization on everything. And this is very much according to the Greek philosophers. This is what they do. They just have a lot of this sort of thing where they spiritualize things. And he was bringing this into his view of the scriptures in talking with this Trifo, who probably is an imaginary person. Justin's invective against Jews and Judaism entered the mainstream of Christian thought and became a sinister influence which contributed not a little to the development of what is known as Christian anti-Semitism. He was, in fact, the first Christian anti-Semite. And all of the church fathers that followed him they all had negative things to say about the Jews. So I think as you look at this, you can kind of see historically why things developed this way. And you can see why there was an aversion to the Jews because of what had happened in the Jewish wars. You can see why these Gentiles who came up in this Greek mixture of various kinds of paganism would react the way they did, and how Justin happened to be the person that crystallized this so that then everybody could start quoting him. It could start the ball rolling for Gentile Christianity. Here's some of what he had to say in Dialogue with Trifo. He said, for the circumcision according to the flesh, which is from Abraham, was given for a sign that you may be separated from other nations and from us, and that you alone may suffer that which you now justly suffer, and that your land may be desolate and your cities burned with fire, and that strangers may eat your fruit in your presence, and not one of you may go up to Jerusalem. Accordingly, these things have happened to you in fairness and justice. So that's his attitude. Again, you can understand it from the standpoint of a Roman and everything that had happened. You can understand why he's saying, well, you're getting what you justly deserve here. But in the process of saying that, he's also saying, well, the Torah that marked you as different, that was given to you so that we would know how bad you are. And so therefore, the Torah became something bad. It became a punishment. That's how he saw it. Now here's more that kind of goes along with that, of how he reduced the Torah to a punishment on the Jews. He said, God enjoined you to keep the Sabbath and impose on you other precepts, in other words, in the Torah, for a sign on account of your unrighteousness and that of your fathers. With these words, he's able to dismiss the authority of the Torah and totally do away with it. Here's more. He says, We too would observe your circumcision of the flesh, your Sabbath days, and in a word, all your festivals, if we were not aware of the reason why they were imposed upon you, namely, because of your sins and the hardness of your heart. So again, saying, you Jews, you're such bad people that God made you do all this stuff. But we're better, so we don't have to. That was the attitude. Of course, 
that's not justified. Because to judge the words of a perfect God by the imperfections of his people is really a big mistake, isn't it? If we applied the same thing to Christians, what would we have to say then about God? Right? So it's not really a good argument. So what is the effect of this argument? Well, the effect is to totally set aside the authority of the Torah and the Scriptures and everything Hebraic. That means, too, to set aside the authority of the Nazarenes, the Despicini, the remnant of Israel. So this is like totally casting off the authority structure that Yahweh had set up, that Messiah himself was ruling over, and now to go it alone. This was, in fact, a schism. Well, this, unfortunately, was not just Justin. As we see here, Irenaeus, who was another real giant among Christians, we're told, was very familiar with Justin's writings and starts from Justin in many of the things that he says. So in other words, he's picking up from what Justin said and he's taking it further. So like I say, Justin started the ball rolling and then the other church fathers just kept pushing this further and further. Now let's, for example, look into the next century at origin of Alexandria. This is what he had to say. We may thus assert in utter confidence that the Jews will not return to their earlier situation, for they have committed the most abominable of crimes in forming this conspiracy against the Savior of the human race. Hence, the city where Jesus suffered was necessarily destroyed, the Jewish nation was driven from its country, and another people was called by God to the blessed election. So how long have Christians thought that? For a very long time. And it started with these early church fathers. You notice they're totally ignoring the fact that there's still a remnant of Israel called the Nazarenes who are following Messiah. They're totally ignoring those people even exist. And they're painting all of the Jews with the same brush. They're all Christ killers. Is that right? Of course it isn't right. Not only that, the Jews that lived in that generation, they didn't kill Christ, did they? They weren't there. They weren't part of it. Can you hate all of those individual Jews because of something that had happened now? almost 200 years earlier. But this is what you find among these early church fathers. Well, moving forward into the next century, this is how bad it got. This is Chrysostom. The synagogue is worse than a brothel the refuge of brigands and debauchees, and the cavern of devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ, a house worse than a drinking shop, a den of thieves, a house of ill fame, a dwelling of iniquity, the refuge of devils, a gulf and an abyss of perdition. I would say the same things about their souls. As for me, I hate the synagogue, I hate the Jews for the same reason. So this pretty much became the common attitude of the Gentile Christians. Now, when they said this about the Jews, did they forget the Roman that stuck the sword in the side of Yeshua? And I'm pretty sure that wasn't the Hebrew cross that he was nailed to. 
Wasn't that a Roman cross? So you see, they clung to Rome but they attack the Hebrews. It doesn't seem like a reasonable accusation when you look at what really happened. So this was the development that happened, and it happened really quickly. You know, after Justin, the change is dramatic that you find. And as you look at this, you see the roots of everything you see in Christianity today. You know, the whole thing, the, the misrepresentation of Paul, the misrepresentation of the history of Christianity as if it did go all the way back to the apostles, which it does not. The spiritualization of the literal truths of Scripture over and over again. And then you have all the incorporation of all this Greek stuff all this paganism and philosophy. And you see a lot of the same stuff going on. Well, here's the very important part of the development of the Christian church. In Saints and Sinners, the History of the Popes, it says, the tradition that Peter and Paul had been put to death at the hands of Nero in Rome about the year AD 64, was universally accepted in the second century. And by the end of that century, pilgrims to Rome were being shown the trophies of the apostles, their tombs. Yet in all of this, the New Testament is silent. Later, legend would fill out the details of Peter's life and death in Rome. They needed some way to sanctify Rome. And I think that's difficult. But they did it by inventing this myth that Peter and Paul were martyred there in Rome and had started the church in Rome and that Peter had the keys to the kingdom and passed those on down and so on and made Rome the leader. goes on, these stories were to be accepted as sober history by some of the greatest minds of the early church, Origen, Ambrose, Augustine. But they are pious romance, not history. And the fact is that we have no reliable accounts either of Peter's later life or of the manner or place of his death. All the indications are that there was no single bishop at Rome for almost a century after the death of the apostles. So in other words, the whole story is a lie, and yet it was propagated by what are called here the greatest minds of the early church, some of the greatest so-called church fathers. Were they the church fathers? Why do they call them the church fathers? You know why? Because they're the church fathers. That's the reason. You know, that's kind of a mystifying term, isn't it? The church fathers. If the Christian church was actually from apostolic times, then who would the church fathers be? It would be the apostles. So the very fact that they claim these men as the church fathers should tell you these are the people that actually gave birth to Christianity, not the apostles. Well, there's other things here. I don't know how well you can see these pictures, but on the left you have Saul Invictus, the Roman sun god. Notice around his head the rays of light in the nimbus. And then on the other side, you have Mithras, the sun god. Notice around his head, the rays of light and the nimbus around his head. In the middle, well, you recognize him? That's the Roman Jesus. 
I think if you were a worshiper of Saul Invictus, it would be very easy simply to change his name to Jesus and keep doing what you've been doing all along, wouldn't it? Or Mithras, as the case may be. Especially since, coincidentally, they all were born on December 25th. The changes in the church over the first four centuries were bound by a subtle but common thread, sun worship. That's why Christians worship on what day? Sunday. Have you ever heard of an Easter sunrise service? And what about Easter? The name is the name of a false god. Bunnies. How about bunnies? Lilies. Where do you think that comes from? And what about eggs, a fertility symbol? Do you think that the Virgin Mary had some eggs around on the resurrection morning and that's where that comes from? All of this came from paganism. And it's continued today. And the worst part about that is the knowledge of these things is freely known. You can look it up in an encyclopedia. And does anybody really care? Not many. In the book Search of Early Christianity, it says this. As this massive apostasy from his teachings was taking place, what happened to the group labeled Jewish Christians. Now, I really like how he says that because he talks of them, he says they're labeled Jewish Christians. You know what? In every Christian history book that I've ever seen, when they talk about the people that are clearly called Nazarenes in Scripture and through history, they call them Jewish Christians. And they're taking their name of Christian and just extending it back. And that's a lie. They were never Jewish Christians. They were Messianic Jews, which is an entirely different thing. And they continued to be Messianic Jews after the Gentile Christians were worshiping the sun god. Does it make me mad? Yeah, it does. As startling as it may sound, the religion of the world, known as Christianity, was not founded by Jesus Christ. Now, how hard is that really to figure out? Can you imagine Yeshua doing these pagan rites? Of Christianity? Do you think he would do that? Unlike Justin, Yeshua kept the Torah. He would not do that. Within the span of 300 years, this religion had become a vast organization with a clergy presiding over rites taken from pagan mysteries and it had borrowed the best elements of Greek philosophy and had formed a dogma appealing to human reason and emotion. This religious organization had become a powerful political force in the Roman Empire. That is the Christian church. Well, how did that happen? How did they become such a powerful force? A political force. Well, that all had to do with Constantine, Emperor Constantine. The accession of Constantine was a turning point for early Christianity. Now, you have to realize they had developed all of this that I'm talking about to a point now where when Constantine came along, they were all ready for what he had in mind. 
In 313, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan decriminalizing Christian worship. They had gone through a period of persecution, and so Constantine was a bit of a hero in bringing that to an end. And then he became a great patron of the Christian church. In fact, it tells us he set a precedent for the position of the Christian emperor within the church. Only problem is he wasn't a Christian. So he was a pagan emperor, but he essentially set himself up as the emperor of the church. That's what happened. And I might add, the bishops, the leadership, went along with that. It goes on, the notion of orthodoxy, Christendom, ecumenical councils, and the state church of the Roman Empire declared by edict in 380. So all of this just tended towards this end of solidifying all of this into one big institution, one big state church. In 325, Constantine summoned the first council of Nicaea, effectively the first ecumenical council. The council of Nicaea is the first major attempt by Christians to define orthodoxy for the whole church. So under Constantine, in his desire to pull together his empire and bring harmony between the different religious elements, he had this big meeting, and he wanted the Christians to be easier to control. So by basically crystallizing their leadership under his control, then he is able to maintain leadership in his empire, unity between these different groups. And this is clearly the reason why you see this about Christianity, that they adopted Christmas, for example, which is the birthday of these other gods. They adopted a lot of things that's the same as these other gods. And it's Constantine's effort here, taking elements from things that are already done, bringing it all together, to amalgamate all the religions together under Christianity. And if this doesn't foreshadow what is soon to happen here on planet Earth, then I don't know what would. This is exactly what is going to happen under Babylon the Great. And we're getting closer to this. Everything is being laid and it's all a matter of tolerance, right? We tolerate you, you tolerate us, and just rolling it all together into one big thing. And this is what Constantine did. This is how the Christian church crystallized into an institution. Just before his death in May 337, Constantine was baptized. So he had done all this. He never was a Christian until just before he died. And so how can Christians feel that this was okay? How is it that it's okay for Christians to have as their ultimate leader a pagan and allow him to dictate what they're going to do? I think they were better off when they were being murdered in the arena. I think they were a lot better off when they were being burned to death on crosses. This, what this represents is a complete capitulation to the Romans. You know, sometimes if you can't get what you want with the stick, you use the carrot. And that's basically what Constantine did. And the success of it was monumental for the kingdom of darkness. Before this happened, before the Council of Nicaea, just a few years, according to the Irish priest Malachi Martin, someone who had access to Vatican records that you and I would never see, he wrote this in the decline and fall of the Roman church. He says a meeting took place between Sylvester, 
who was the bishop of Rome, and Jewish Christian leaders. This is in 318. The oldest of these, he calls them Christian Jews. They were Nazarenes. Spoke on behalf of the Despicini. He tells us who the Despicini are. And I don't, I'm not including all that here. I couldn't fit it all in my chart. Now, I talked about this in an earlier presentation about the Despicini. And who they are is these are the relatives of Yeshua Messiah, of his family. These are descendants of David. And they had actually led the assemblies essentially up to the time of Justin. Malachi Martin acknowledges that in this part of his book. Now he talks about their demands. He says the Despicinis demanded that Sylvester, who now had Roman patronage, revoke his confirmation of the authority of the Greek Christian bishops at Jerusalem, in Antioch, in Ephesus, and in Alexandria, and to name Despicinos bishops to take their place. So he's telling them the Despicini should be the ones, as they were in the past, that are the leaders. It says also, they ask that the practice of sending cash to Jerusalem as the mother church be resumed. That they would get support in leading the believers. But it says these blood relatives of Christ demanded the reintroduction of the law, which included the Sabbath and the Holy Day system of feasts and new moons of the Bible. What were they really saying to this man, Sylvester, this bishop? To me, this reads like what was happening as they were reproving him. They were telling him, you're on the wrong path. If you want to get on the right path, this is what you need to do. And they weren't looking for a compromise with evil. They were saying, do the right thing, and this is what the right thing is. Sylvester dismissed their claims. That's not a big surprise, is it? And said that from now on, the mother church was Rome, and he insisted they accept the Greek bishops. This was the last known dialogue with the Sabbath-keeping church in the East, led by the disciples who were descended from blood relatives of Jesus the Messiah. Well, what Malachi Martin doesn't say here is what happened after this. And what happened after this is the Roman church considered these people the most dangerous people in the world to them. Because these were the people who actually did have authority to lead the believers. And therefore, they were hunted down, they were chased, they were driven into obscurity driven underground and they're very hard to find after this particular meeting so what have we got now well we're back to our timeline and we see what happened we have israel on the top the timeline of israel and notice it continued right along Yes, there were some changes. The Messiah came. There was a new covenant. He set into place the Davidic leadership according to the Davidic covenants. And there continued to be Davidic leaders, as we've seen, all the way to 318 and beyond. That had been in place the whole time of the other events we're talking about. We saw Judaism breaking off of true Israel as a schism. And how everything that Messiah said would happen with them happened. 
They had these Jewish wars. They ended up being completely decimated. They ended up being scattered throughout the earth. Jerusalem was trampled on by the Gentiles from that time forward. And that's exactly what happened. Everything that Messiah said. We see the effect of that, of those Roman wars that happened, finally culminating in the second century, around the middle of the second century, with the Gentile believers. By now, there were many more Gentiles who claimed to believe in Christos. And they wanted to follow him. But many of them did not want to leave all of the Greek customs. You know, it's so interesting. When you read Paul writing, for instance, to the Corinthians, he established these congregations. And he is struggling with them to get them to walk in the truth. He's struggling against all of their pagan practices. He's an apostle. So it's no big surprise, really, that finally in the second century, the Gentiles completely broke away. And this is what happened. This is the true beginning of the Christian church. That's what you'll see as you follow this time chart along. And you can see how the events of history come together to make that happen. You will also see that Israel never changed. Israel is in the new covenant with Yeshua Messiah. There was Davidic leadership set up over Israel. And here's the deal. Yahweh has one plan. People can try to change his plan. This is what the Christian church has done, even trying to rewrite history, say, no, oh, we're the real ones when actually what they are is the schismatic group, a sect that broke off from the real followers of Messiah, trying to lay claim to that apostolic background. It does not belong to them. And Yahweh knows that. The Messiah knows that. And the hopes that so many have thinking they're part of the church, that they're going to be raptured off to be with Messiah, that the church is going to be raptured away and rescued so those awful Jews can be dealt with. Well, guess what? None of that is going to happen. If you're a Christian and you live your normal life, you are going to go through the Great Tribulation. Are you ready for that? Constantinian apostasy, the apostasy, that fatal period when the Emperor Constantine called himself a Christian. From this time onward, the Christians had no more of the Spirit of Christ than the heathen. You know who said that? John Wesley, a very famous Christian. You know, a lot of the Protestants, they want to divorce themselves from the errors of the Catholic Church, the excesses of the Catholic Church, from Constantine forward. And I don't blame them for wanting to do that. But in doing that, they're totally overlooking all of the paganism that came into the church before Constantine. And they themselves continue to practice it. They are doing Christmas. They are doing Easter. They have adopted all of these ideas of Justin, about the Apostle Paul, about the New Testament. They have all of this spiritualization of Bible prophecy. They have all of that stuff that Justin did. As a matter of fact, they look back to him and the other church fathers for direction. They are not free from the apostasy just because they disavow Constantine. It didn't start with Constantine. It crystallized under Constantine. That's what actually happened.
in another book, Ancient, Medieval, and Modern Christianity. It says, Christianity began with very simple practices all taken from Judaism. Then they were amplified, and gestures familiar to the pagans were added. It is sometimes very difficult to tell exactly from which pagan rite a particular Christian rite is derived. But it remains certain that the spirit of pagan ritualism became by degrees impressed upon Christianity to such an extent that at last the whole of it might be found distributed through its entire ceremonies. And really, in so many Christian churches, when you go into that Christian church and you look around, is that anything like what you read about in the New Testament? You see the people wearing the special garments and saying these special kinds of prayers and so on, maybe even in a foreign language. You see these holy items that they have, and in some cases you have idols right in the church. Can you imagine any such thing among the apostles of Yeshua Messiah? Where did all that come from? Where did it all come from? Well, it's telling us this all came from paganism, and most of it came in during this period we're talking about. When you look at all this, it's little wonder that Rome was often referred to as Babylon. Augustine said this in his famous City of God. To be brief, the city of Rome was founded like another Babylon, and as it were, the daughter of the former Babylon, by which God was pleased to conquer the whole world and subdue it far and wide by bringing it into one fellowship of government and laws. Now here's the interesting thing about Augustine. You know, you would think if somebody is saying, well, Rome is Babylon, they're thinking that's a bad thing, right? Uh-uh, that's yes, what he's thinking. The city of God is Rome. He's saying that God used Rome to consolidate his kingdom. He's speaking of Rome and Babylon in a positive light. This is what the thinking was. A modern-day cardinal in faith of our father said, the penetration of the religion of Babylon became so general and well-known that Rome was called the New Babylon. And this is true. The Jewish literature also calls Rome Babylon. And Peter speaks of Babylon, and many people think he's really speaking about Rome. The book of Revelation speaks about Babylon. And I believe it's speaking to people of our day. In the book of Revelation, Revelation 17 goes on quite extensively to identify Babylon the Great of the tribulation period. And there are many identifiers that track closely with Rome. One of the things is that it's on seven hills, as Rome is on seven hills. There's other things there. And after laying out all of this information, it says an angel cried with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, and she's become a habitation of demons, a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you have no participation in her sins and that you don't receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to the sky and God has remembered her iniquities. There are benefits to understanding history. One of those benefits is being able to identify Babylon the Great. Because 
there will be a great punishment that will fall on Babylon as surely as the vengeance of God fell upon first century Judaism. It will come. And it is at least as well deserved. I think even more deserved. We are living in a time where we need to respond to this call to get out of Babylon. Now, he says, my people. Those who are not his people, they're not going to get out. There's nothing you can say to them. (laughs) There's nothing you could do. You can't drag them out with a team of horses. They're not coming. Because they like it there. But there are those people that he's calling to, my people. And they are captives in Babylon. And that's what we've been reading about. Captivity to Babylon. This is how Christianity became captive to Babylon. They turned away from the leadership that God had given them. They turned away from his Torah which is a standard of righteousness, a way to live. And it opened them up to all of these influences that very soon brought them to this place where they were captives, literally, of Babylon. And there's a lot of people who in many ways are good believers who remain captives of Babylon. Their minds, their hearts, are captives of these Babylonian practices. And the time has come. If you're one of those people, you need to get out of that before the roof falls in. Because it's going to. And don't think, don't buy that argument that somehow you're too good for that to happen to you. This is what's going to happen to the Christian church, friends. It's not going to be raptured away. It's going to crystallize into Babylon the Great, and it is going to be destroyed. That's what's going to happen to the Christian church. Don't be in it when that happens. That's the importance for us for all of this history. And I hope you've been blessed by it. If you want to study this chart a little more closely, just contact us at our website and let me know where I can send this to you, and I'd be glad to send you a copy of it. Judaics and Christians into Babylon, 2nd century A.D. Something to think about. Are you ready for the events that will be happening in the near future? Eliyahu ben David's seminar on the book of Daniel will give you further insight into what is going on in the world today and help you develop an action plan to prepare for the judgment that will soon take place on the earth. Come sign up today at tsiyon.net and watch Eliyahu ben David's free seminar on the book of Daniel.